said, our talk is um, titled Dynamic Security Roles in Airflow for Multi-Tenancy. And what that really means is how we created roles dynamically within Airflow, tied them to individual DAGs, and all of that ties back to Active Directory groups because our client wanted to um, create a shared multi-tenant Airflow instance or instances to help cut costs and other things that we'll go into more detail later on. I guess I'll, I'll just, I'll start introducing myself. Um, hopefully the slide will switch over. Like Brian said, my name is Mark Merling. I'm a male Korean American wearing glasses and I'm currently in my home office. If you're lucky, you might see some of my cats running around and hopefully they don't knock anything over while I'm in the middle of this talk because they've done that before. Um, I'm a data engineering manager at Maven Wave. And while working, I've had the opportunity to lead and build data platforms in AWS and Google Cloud. I've worked with financial data where I was helping build reporting solutions for community banks. I've worked with operational data, primarily in the government federal space. And most recently I've been working with healthcare data to transform it to fit um, industry standards. And personally, my favorite client was the one where Sean and I worked together on this effort. And we'll give some more details about the client landscape and, and all that great stuff. Awesome. So I'm Sean Lewis. Uh, I'm a senior data engineer at Excella Consulting. A little bit about kind of my physical appearance as well. I'm about six feet tall. I'm a white American male. And you may not be able to tell, but my beard is very orange. Um, a little bit about my background in the professional world. Uh, I was got a degree in computer science and then started my career at Excella Consulting in kind of the data space, doing some visualization work and then some analysis work. And then ultimately I arrived at the data engineering role that I'm currently in. Uh, a fun little fact about Mark and I, we actually played on the same Frisbee team for a couple of months before we ever realized that we worked at the exact same company and our company is not that big. So yeah, exciting stuff. So what we wanna do to start is kind of lay the landscape for the multi-tenancy need at our federal clients. Mark was the first person on the ground uh, at the federal client site and noticed a need for a data orchestration tool that could seamlessly integrate, but had the ability to have lots of custom functionality built in. And so he ultimately landed on Airflow and that is how Airflow got its start on our client site. At the client side itself, there was two primary uh, categories of, of issues or things that we needed to work through. And hopefully the multi-tenancy approach would help with that. First was we had a bunch of small contractually separate agile teams and those teams really were focused on rapid development for the organization itself. And with that rapid development, we wanted to have a way of having shared resources easily transcend teams so that we could have even better feature development. Secondly, there was this technology situation that was arising uh, as cloud infrastructure became more popular. And that was that we had multiple Airflow instances all hosted in AWS, all running relatively the same backends. And, and in this instance, it was a Postgres SQL RDS instance supporting kind of the data layer underneath. Um, some of the things with the technology that we wanted to accomplish were, we needed a way to keep DAGs and certain functionality uh, private to specific teams. And this was something that um, the multi-tenant approach helped us with. We also wanted to mitigate costs throughout the organization we felt like it was a little bit wasteful to have so many EC2s and so many backends essentially doing the same thing at the same time. So we thought that we could tweak that, tweak that EC2 instance um, cost for the organization. And then lastly, leveraging some of the DevOps infrastructure that had been set up, we wanted a way to allow for independent deployment cadence across multiple teams, as we didn't wanna really have a tie to a specific development date for for departments across the organization. So that's kind of the lay of the land when it comes to multi-tenancy and the need around that. Yeah, and, and you'll notice that we were running in AWS. And so some of you might be thinking, why not use the Airflow Managed Service? So that didn't exist when we started this project. And if any of you have worked in the federal sector, you know that they have different rules for what you can and cannot be used in the cloud. And so that was something that was too new to be a reasonable option at the time. 
And continuing on, so another caveat is we started this work last year in the fall. So we were running Airflow 1.10.14. There are updates in Airflow 2.0 and there are updates in Flask App Builder since then that incorporate some of the changes we're talking about. Um, some of our work was and it was based off of a PR that had not been approved until recently, but there, there are some differences and later on we'll, we'll highlight some of those differences just so that you all are aware. But going back on the current or the landscape as it was back in the fall. Um, so back then with RBAC and Airflow, new roles and would have to be created manually. And that means creating the role and assigning permissions. And if you have new users, you have to also go in manually and update them to have the proper roles. And that's just, in my mind, kind of annoying. Hopefully you don't have to do it often, but it still takes up time and you have this dependency. And because it's all manual, of course, there are not any ties to an organizational groups and grouping system like Active Directory. So our solution, we have roles that are created automatically, and we have some variables that we're creating in the web server config file that we'll talk about more. Um, these roles have what I would call skeleton permissions. So they actually can't see all the DAGs. I think if you were to use the default viewer role or um, something like that, if memory serves correct, by default, you can see all DAGs. And that's something we were trying to prevent from happening. And we create that explicit tie between the role and the DAGs that they should have access to by using that can edit, can read argument when you create your DAGs. And we have a screenshot to capture that if that's something you haven't heard about before. Um, but yeah. And and so here, we kind of want to get into the high-level solutioning that we did for our Airflow LDAP RBAC implementation. Um, so we're just going to walk through a couple of the, the key uh, files and key options that need to be configured in order to get this up and running. So first off, um, Airflow 2.0 comes standard with RBAC uh, actually configured and set up to go. So in the Airflow config file, you'll see a variable RBAC set to true in one dot x and before that was not the case so just off the bat you have to go in and set the rbac uh, variable in the airflow config file to be true next we made some configuration changes in the web server config python file and so this was to essentially first off configure the ldap variable in there to be set to the, how your organization has your ldap set up next we want to set the public role as the default role. And as Mark mentioned, this was essentially to prevent people from being able to see other information and DAGs in the UI right off the bat. Lastly, and these next two points are kind of combined together, but you got to set a way for your variables to understand what specific groups to look for in your LDAP configuration. And then from that, you have to create a mapping dictionary where you associate the airflow role with a specific AD group that you um, want to leverage in your LDAP configuration. Yep, and um, just in case people are wondering if you have never used LDAP with RBAC in Airflow, when we set that default role, like that is tied to some organizational group. So everybody within that group can log in, but because we're forcing them to be the public role, they, they see nothing. They can log in um, as opposed to getting some error that they can't see anything. So. That was kind of the, the stopgap measure for us. And we created a custom security class. So if you've looked at it before, you know that it, <clears throat> excuse me, we are inheriting from the Airflow security class, which is technically inheriting from the Flask App Builder security class as well. And so there are certain functions that we either overwrote or um, we created some new ones just to help do the logic that we wanted. And part of that logic is initializing the custom role mappings. And we have a screenshot later on to help describe that more. Um, and yeah, there is like kind of what I call a hacky thing for refreshing role membership. And we'll talk about that some more as well. And um, hopefully this will all make sense. So please start sending questions if, you, if something doesn't make sense, we'll answer them at the end. So first off, that web server config.py file we mentioned, um, we just kind of want to walk through some of the key things that we implemented. Uh, you'll notice that we have the security manager class variable. 
And in that variable is where you would typically put the Airflow security manager that comes out of the box. However, we wanted to obviously overwrite that and use it for a different, different purpose. So we go ahead and set that up here. Next, you'll see the auth LDAP group field. Um, for us, it was the member of uh, value in that LDAP configuration that we really wanted to capture because different users across the organizations are associated with different groups and the member of field highlights that for us. So next, you'll notice the role mapping and this is just a dictionary of key value pairs. The key being the Airflow role that you want to associate with the specific group from the LDAP configuration you have on site. All right, and this is a screenshot of part of the initialization step or the init for the class. Um, we're tying to the two new variables that were created in 21, 22, and 23 is where we're saying, um, where we're actually creating the new roles with the name that we want. So it uses the key in the role mapping, which is the role name, and it adds it to the list and assigns it all these default permissions. Um, and like I said earlier, basically we wanted the user to be able to log in and see everything uh, except being able to see all DAGs until that explicit tie is created where they can see that individual DAG. Um, so I, I know that sounds kind of weird, but basically what I'm trying to say is when you log in, if you were able to see a DAG, you would be able to see the DAG history, you'd be able to trigger the DAG and all that great stuff. But if you don't have that explicit tie to that DAG, you would just see an empty um, page. And this is where I was talking about the can DAG, can read. Sorry, I'm, I'm butchering it. But if you look at line 27, this is just an argument you can pass into your DAG. And here we have the role grants analytics team. So in our role mapping, we had a key that where the key was grants analytics team, the value was the, the group. And then in here, we're saying we want this DAG to be tied to that role explicitly so that if you are a member of the grants analytics team role, you can see this DAG and do all the fun stuff you want to do with it in the UI. And it really, for this slide, if you look at line 222 um, to 228-ish, right around there is the most important thing. Um, so in 222, we are adding roles to the user. So by default, they'll have public, but we also want them to have whatever role that they should have based off the role mapping. And um, because we are forcing a refresh of the roles when people log in and, and the roles and per associated permissions when they log in, if you were to manually go in and assign somebody the admin role, that would actually be lost because uh, unless you have a, a group that maps to the admin role. And so, in here, there's a way to just say, hey, name equals whatever, tie the admin role to their list of roles as well so that they're always an admin. Um, but like I, I said, you could also do that in the role mapping if you wanted to. And then lastly, the kind of solution that we came up with for making all of this actually work and carry out to the, the UI is on login so you'll see here this is just a basic cli sync permissions and what this does is it waits for the specific user to log in captures that user and then refreshes their permissions um, when they do log in now there's you know pretty obviously a couple of better ways to do this right on dag creations on dag refreshes when the scheduler picks up new things um, but for our specific circumstance and situation that we were in, this was kind of the quickest and easiest way of, of getting those permissions synced back to the users. Yeah, and so practically that means, let's say you're logged in, your team creates a new DAG, you deploy your code to the Airflow instance, but you can't see that DAG. All, all you have to do is log out and log back in, and then assuming that DAG has the access control set for the right role, then you can see that DAG. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, we alluded to this earlier. Airflow 2.0 has a bunch of new features. Um, if you haven't checked it out, highly recommend it. But specifically, it does tie into our talk as well. So in February of this year, Flask App Builder released 3.2.0, and that incorporated some of the 
changes from that PR that I referenced that we looked at in order to help develop our solution. So there's three additional variables that they add, auth roles mapping, auth LDAP group field, and auth roles sync at login. So auth roles mapping, I think the key is the, in our case, it would be the Active Directory group that we're trying to reference. And then the value would be the role. Um, and so by default, you have in Airflow, you only have certain roles that you can tie to. So that means somebody would still have to go in and create new roles if they wanted to have their own custom roles. And they would have to still assign those permissions if they wanted to have those new roles. Um, so slightly less burden because you still can tie users to roles through Active Directory or through a group, but somebody still has to create those roles. Auth LDAP group field matches exactly what we had where we put member of, you could put whatever is relevant to your organization. And while we did say that syncing permissions at login feels kind of hacky, it turns out that it seems like it might be the easiest way. And so Flask App Builder actually incorporated that with the auth role sync at login. So it's just a Boolean. And when you log in, it'll reset your permissions based off um, mapping and, and what you have set in the web server config. And so, like I said before, if you are, if you have somebody manually assigning roles to a user, they would be overridden at, at this point. And so kind of in summary, uh, the key things that the multi-tenant approach uh, is helping us to solve or mitigate is first off cost. So Airflow is obviously a very powerful data orchestration tool with a lot of um, end users like AWS starting to consume and create libraries for integrating into their services uh, in Python. So being able to move from a four-ish EC2s running Airflow down to one EC2 running Airflow um, has really saved our organization or the client that we were working for a decent amount of money. Um, a definite, additionally, having shared infrastructure resources is huge. Um, there's a lot of things that we can leverage in the cloud space by just having one Airflow instance up and running. So that's also a, an added benefit of, of implementing an RBAC custom solution with Airflow for multi-tenancy. Secondly is we were able to achieve the privacy necessary for our client to allow multiple different departments access to this uh, Airflow instance and keeping things separate out, separated in the web server um, UI. And so again, Mark kind of touched on it pretty thoroughly here with assigning certain roles, can edit, can read permissions, and then associating those with specific DAGs. Um, and that was a, a big game changer for us for, for moving to multi-tenancy. And then some kind of side effects of our multi-tenant implementation is having the ability to share best practices and code collaboration, specifically in things like operators or plugins. So we did develop a lot of custom functionality for specific operators that we needed to get jobs to run and to get data to move. And being able to share that across the organization has been pretty big for us and has helped with that agile rapid development mindset. Um, lastly, we were also able to keep our independent production deployability. So no team is necessarily reliant on another team's cadence schedule or production cadence schedule or has to go to production with those um, other groups. Our Jenkins pipelines are set up to be independent. And so everyone's code lives in their own Bitbucket repository. And then that code can be deployed to the multi-tenant Airflow server without having any disruption to any other team or requiring any other team to deploy as well. So those are kind of the big business context that we wanted to focus on um, when implementing the multi-tenant approach at our client site. And I would say it was pretty successful uh, on the whole.